I'll have to give you this microphone so that people online also hear you. How about uh, legal reasons um, but in different stores? Is, is there, um, how is it to, to have an app maybe uh, so in can be sold in one store and can't be in another because it's running mostly in another country? And Or is it all about US laws because it's all Intel? Or is it uh, the branded? Uh you mean the, the reason for us to have these branded stores? No, 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 no. Uh, no. It's for, for me as developer, you know. Ah. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um. Well, there are s there are some legal issues for some technology. Um, we ask f about that when you're submitting. For example, if you use certain encryption technologies, then that is not allowed to be exported in, in, in some countries. Um, so during app submission, there are some questions. And uh, as a developer, you can also say, I, would I don't want my application in this country. So you can also uh, narrow that down. Can can you say a few words about the approval process? Yes. Will you, will you pre-screen the, the software we're uploading or are we allowed to sell porn on your store? I will I'll explain about the validation approval process uh, in a few moments, okay? Thank you. Uh, but we don't do porn. Um, worldwide reach. Um, on this light blue side over here where it says consumer, um, apps can be download free apps can be downloaded from any consumer anywhere in the world. Uh, paid apps uh, only in certain countries. We are still growing the number of countries we can reach. But major US, Canada, most of Europe and Asia Pac, the, the big countries are already there. Developer side, um, anyone in the world can submit a free application. Paid applications we can only accept from these uh, 24, 50, 61 countries. Germany is on there, you don't need to look for it. Um, and Poland, I think somebody's from Poland. Poland should also be on here. Let me see. Poland, there we are. Poland. Any other country? Germany, Poland, anyone else? No? Sell to China. Uh, there are some um, issues. We're working on that at the moment. And uh, we should be able to sell to China very soon, throughout the sometime this year. I can't give you a, f a fixed date, but we're working on that. As I said, we're expanding continuously, and China is definitely on our list. And it's coming up. Okay? Japan is not on the list yet. Uh, there's obviously a language issue. Uh, you would have to do your, your application in Japanese or in Chinese, yes. But there's a big uh, English-speaking population in Hong Kong, for example. But it also opens up the... Japanese is definitely uh, a, a language we need to go to, especially because we've got Monica on our team, who's half Japanese. I don't know which half, but the best half, maybe. Uh, and... Um, but uh, there's no plan I can tell you about, and there's no dates I can give to you. But we want to expand. There's an, uh, uh, a list of countries we want to go to, and we're doing them one at a time. Okay? Supporting innovative MIGO application development. Okay. Um, we don't want to r beat around the bush. Uh, there's no big market for MIGO applications, no big demand for MIGO applications in the market today. We know, because there's not a lot of devices out there. MIGO is starting, I would say, it's still in its infancy of getting into the industry, into the market. We'll see more and more devices this year. But when these devices come out in the second half of this year, um, when they hit the retailers, hit the shops, we want our store to be there and we want to have applications in our store. So we have to talk to you developers and have to say, guys, girls, guys, please develop application for our store. Now, why should you develop an application for Migo? Well, you could just as well do it for some other operating system. Um, so we're trying to encourage you to do it by coming to see you this evening in Berlin and uh, to help you by giving you a tablet so you can already start developing a tablet application. 
So these are these worldwide application labs. I'm not only doing it in Germany, we're doing this all over the world. This year we did uh, three of these application labs in San Francisco at AppNation. Um, what we're also doing is we've got competitions. There are competitions running. If you go to the website appdeveloperintel.com opportunities, you can check this out. There is a number of competitions there where you can win prizes or keep the money. So for example, here's one example. Hit the afterburners, the most elegant Migo app. So if you submit your Migo application and we think it's the most elegant of all these applications that have been submitted, you could get a five-day supersonic adventure flying jets in Russia. So it's quite a cool thing. But if you don't have the time because you need to do the next application, you can also stay at home and get $50,000. That's not bad as well. Um, there are other competitions. I think there's about eight different types of competitions running throughout until September, roughly. Check them out. The prizes are ranging between $20,000, $20,000 up to $50,000. Have a look. It's quite a lot of money for a, for a nice application. Maybe the somebody has already an application at home. And um, not all of them are Migo only. This is Migo only. Some of them are Windows or Migo. So maybe somebody's got a nice application at home who's just, has just been waiting to give out into the, f into the open air and show everyone. Have a look. Open up your drawers. Have a look at your hard drives. Submit your application, you might win $50,000. Um, what we're also doing is, um, this is almost, I think this is almost closed this week. It was called Submit Early for Migo. Uh, the first 100 applications that got submitted and validated got $500 each. And uh, that closed this week, unfortunately. You're a bit late already. Um, and out of the, f the first 100, we're going to pick the 10 best and give them another $1,000 on top. Um, that might come again, but it's closed for the moment. Um, what, is what we started last year and what's what we're going to continue to do is support for developers. So if you have a fantastic idea for an application, um, but you need some financial support to do it, you need some money to build your application because you need to employ some other developers or you need uh, some designer to do some artwork for you and you need money to pay these people. So you can submit your idea to our website under this web address, support for developers, and you can ask for funding. And we will f if we think your application is ideal and we like it, we'd like it into our store, we will fund your application development work. There is different ways of funding, different programs. Um, the easiest is we pay you your 70% up front. So out of every application that gets sold, you get 70% of the money, and we pay this 70% up front. Um, there's no fixed sum. There's no limit to this sum that I know of. Monica, I don't know. I haven't seen any limit. No, there's no limit I know of. You have to submit your idea and ask for funding and there's a group of people that meet regularly and they look at these applications and uh, Will uh, Intel then uh, own part of the software? That no. Uh, no, no, no. We do not own this software. This is the funding we give to you because we want your application in our store. And the, the IP remains with you as a developer or ISV. It's a, it's a NRE. We don't want to ask for payback as well. Um, is this also possible for applications that exist already on another platform to port it? Um, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but if you would leave your email address with either Monica or myself, then we will check for you and come back to you with an answer. Okay, I don't want to give you a wrong answer today. I would like to check that, okay? okay? But I think it'll be a good answer. Okay, so have a look at this. If you need some financial support to do your application, have a look, check it out, submit your ideas and get some money. Um, I guess you all know these angry birds. <laughs> um, angry birds, 
we brought to Windows. So we talked to Rovio, and Rovio ported Angry Birds to Windows. So if you want, you can have a if you still have a Windows PC or a netbook or notebook at home, you can install the App App Store on your PC on your Windows device and play Angry Birds at home. Um, we're also talking to Angry Birds to bring that to other operating systems like Mego. Um, and we're doing this with other figurehead applications that are out there on the market. So we're looking for uh, applications that consumers know, applications that have been in the press a lot, that people have seen and think they're very, very important and are, and are out in the press and attract attention. And we're doing this so that consumers um, read more about the application store, that they see it in the press. Oh, Angry Birds is also on App Up now. And this makes the store more attractive, and this also makes it your application in our store more attractive. The store is found, it's seen and attractive, and consumers find your application in the store. So we do this, we invest a lot of time and effort to bring these applications to the store to make it overall more attractive. Four steps of getting your application into the store. Okay, now it's a bit more technical and process driven. Um, it says at the top, join the program. This is essential. We need to know who you are, so we need to know where to send the money to. So you need to join um, the developer program, give your bank details and stuff so we can send you the $500,000 a month that your application has made in the store. Um, set up your development environment, uh, download into the app up SDK suite. I'll explain a bit more what this is uh, after the break, the app up SDK suite. Um, you've all had some experience with Qt Creator possibly and the, the Migo SDK that's available on, on Migo.com. That's included in here, but we add some more to it. Okay. Test, create, and tune. I'm going to explain more about that after the break as well. And submit your application to the store. This is submission, validation. We're going to cover that very soon. That's the next topic. This is the Migo portal on our website. Um, if you go here, it's got different sections. It says here, learn more. So this is where we bring news and how-tos and articles around Migo and developing for Migo. Start developing more articles, tips, hints, tutorials. SDK, downloads and tools, is where we have our tools hidden away, ready for you for downloading. Get help and resources, it's clear what you get here. Find things, ask for support, that's what it's all about. So this is the portal, that's the address, appdeveloper.intel.com slash Migo. This is the tool package um, we're giving uh, to the community who join us, uh, join our developer program. I'm going to explain this in greater detail after the break, so I'll just skip this for the moment. Um, but tell you this is what you can get from Migo.com, and this is what we add to the developer package. And we're going to go through that in a bit more detail after the break. Yes? Where are you? Hands up. Hey! Did you get a microphone? Yes, I got a microphone. And sweet. Is it mandatory to use Qt or can I use just a make file? Just um, excuse me? A make file or another IDE? Do I, do I have no, you, you can use what anything as long as it runs on Migo. Okay. Yep. The Migo App Up SDK. If we go back here, publishing tools, it says publishing tools Intel App Up SDK. This is a piece of software that allows your program to interact with our store. Now, it is not mandatory to do this under Migo. Um, this is a piece of software where your program, your application can interact with the store, okay? Communication, it's a library. You don't have to do this, but if you want to have a paid application, it's, it's really a good idea to do this because it gives you copy protection. 
what it does for you is provides you three different types of services. It gives you, from bottom upwards, crash reporting. Relatively clear what crash reporting means. If your application crashes on an end device, you can get information back where it crashed and what will happen at that time. Of course, the end customer has to agree to this, to send you this information. Uh, if he does, you get feedback what happened at the end customer's device when your application crashed. The next one up, it says here, instrumentation. Yep. Instrumentation is, uh, again, the end user has to agree to this. Uh, instrumentation allows you to get feed information how your application is used. Um, let's say your application has got a new function. You've just introduced a, an update, version 2.0, and you've got this great new function in the, in the application. You think it's fantastic, but you're not sure if the customers are actually finding it and using it. So you could add instrumentation calls, these are start-stop calls around this function and find out are people using it and how many are using it. Um, another example would be this new function, there's three different ways to get to this function. Maybe it's a, a, a key press or a touch panel or a menu call or an event-driven path to this new function. You want to find out which is the most common. Are people able to find this through this method? So you could use instrumentation to find out how are people getting to this function. So you can optimize it. You could find out, might find out, hmm, they're not finding this menu, or the menu is too difficult to use, so you could change the menu structure. So these are, this is a tool that allows you to tune usability and functionality of your application. And at the top, authorization. Authorization is, as it says, uh, the verification that this end user is allowed to use your application on this device. Okay, so this is the copy protection. Uh, it's this is what I would say is mandatory if you want to do a paid application. If you want to do a free application, you don't really need it because you don't want to have a copy protection on there possibly, but you can. Um, if you want to include authorization, this is the minimum code that you need to add to your application. Um, it's a bit small print, but it's basically a try-catch switch, that's all it is. And this big letters where it says PBase example app, this is, what, this is the minimum call that you need to do to get authorization of this application. That's all it is. There's no massive library, there's no source code, things that you need to provide and do yourself and classes and whatever. Include a, bit, a couple of uh, header files and add this. And this does all the communication with the store, does all the, the licensing, does the checks, is this application allowed to run on this device? That's all it is. Very simple, very easy. A question? If I use a uh, component from the App App Store, so I can, uh, if I understand you right, um, you can you can as a developer buy components from other developers and use it in your in your own application. Is it is the component allowed to connect connect to the store even if the main application doesn't does not want it for uh, Datenschutz reasons or whatever? Um. Don't know an answer to that. That's a very specific question. So the question is, if I get this clearly, let's say your application is using a component and this component wants to do authorization or, lo or maybe um, crash reporting or something, and is he allowed to do this uh, although the main application is not doing any communication? That's your question. The second catch uh, statement. Uh, Unauthorized. In the comment, you see, you, you, there's shown if an application or component is yeah. not authorized. Yeah. Um, yes, you, you include this same, th this same piece of code goes into components. That's correct. Uh, but uh, your question was, what happens if the component wants to do this and the main application doesn't? Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe it doesn't matter because the, com the component does its own authorization to the store side. And the application does this. And if the application doesn't, the component would still do this. 
So as, you say, as I said, it's very, very easy. There's no massive source code you need to add. It's more or less this. That's it. We have another question. Do I, do I understand this code correctly, that the uh, authorization can only be executed while connected to the internet? Good question. Um, initially, the authorization uh, for the first time has the device has to be connected to the internet, but it's not a big problem because it's during installation. Okay? The license, the service issues a license to the device. This license is cached on the device for a certain time frame. And after that time frame, it needs to be renewed. So the device has to go online again. The typical scenario is you have this application, you go into the airplane, you can use it, and after a number of days or weeks, uh, I don't actually I don't know how long this is, and I, I don't even know if there's a fixed amount of time, then the license decays and it has to be renewed when the device is online. The developer can um, react differently. The developer does not have to bring an error message. The developer can say, um, okay, this, this license is not there. The authorization failed. And uh, you can say, okay, I'll give the user a grace period. I'll let him do this three times or let him do it for three days or whatever. So you can, you can handle this in your, in your catch statement however you want to handle it. You can bring an error message, no license, we're not going to run. Or you can bring a, a message, uh, please bring your device online to renew your license. We'll give you three days grace period. So you can do whatever you want, whatever you think is best. Okay? But we encourage you to do something, not to ignore it. Um, one last, maybe one last question. Is um, the source code behind this uh, class uh, open source? No, the source code of the, the libraries is not open source, it's closed source. So we do not disclose how the communication to the store. There's another question over here, Monica. Did you get sweets, by the way? Does, does Intel collect other, other information in the library, like uh, positioning and usage data and usernames? No, we do not connect, uh, collect any data, localization data of anything of the end user. Obviously, we know who the user is because he has to sign on to the store so we can bill him. But we don't know where he is or uh, what he's using and how many times he's used this. The only way for that would be for the application to use the instrumentation code. Oops. Uh. Oh. Didn't want to do that. The instrumentation code is the only way to gather information about the usage of the program, and the user has to agree to this. So the, the user is prompted, uh, do you want to agree to this, yes or no? And if it says yes, then we gather information and send that to the back end and the back end to user developer. That's the only method. Privacy is a big topic at Intel. If you ever sign on to our websites and have a look, there's massive privacy statements there. It's a really big topic. I just r uh, recently joined Intel myself and uh, Monica as well, and we had a number of privacy trainings that we had to go through. Application submission. Um, this is an actual screenshot of the submission website. Um, I took the beta site, it already says Simplified Chinese here, um, that's not in, out in the live uh, yet. Um, you see different, uh, instead of jumping up and down, can you see this arrow? So you got different stages, application info, pricing, upload info, app up center, validation and overview. These are different stages that bring you through the submission process. What I highlighted here is that you can create metadata in several languages. So um, if, you upload, if you upload an application that it's multilingual, can do English, German, and French, then you can upload, you upload metadata in three languages as well, in English, German, and French. You upload text, what is the application about, 
uh, icons application name in three different languages, a French name, an English name, and a German name, screenshots, icons, descriptions, categories, everything in, in these languages. And we do this so that the local users get the best experience. And uh, this was only four languages? At, at the moment, we're supporting English and French, and German and Spanish are coming along in next week, two weeks, one or two weeks, and we, we are continuing to add more languages as we go on. But this is what we have today. Can I then add on a language after I already published? Yes, okay. that's possible. Um, so what we're doing here is that uh, we want to give the end user the best experience. Uh, with one binary, you can have several metadata packages for English, German, French, and so on with the same binary. Metadata is all the information we use in the store. So it's the, the, the marketing, the advertising of your application in the store. This is the metadata. This is not something that's used in your application. It's just store data, okay? Um, can you repeat that, please? Will you um, add languages and metadata from countries where you don't sell software, but where people can download their software free? Um, we are uh, these are the languages we do at the moment. We want to uh, extend this. There will be more languages. Uh, will we do that for languages we can't build? I don't know. I don't, can't answer that question. Okay. Obviously, we want to do that for the languages where we can build to first. Uh, major languages. Um. Next step uh, I want to show you. I'm not showing you all of these steps. Um, left out pricing. Pricing is obviously you can set for which country, do you how many euros and dollars do you want. Um, upload info. This is a quite a cool place. Uh, it tells here you can set the runtime. Is it a Windows app? Is it a Migo app? If it's Migo, is it a netbook or a tablet application? There are hardware requirements like GPS and camera. It's already prepared for handsets. And here's the languages. What languages are supported by your binary? If it's a multilingual application, there's a whole line. We've al also got Arabic and Czech and French and all different languages here. What... Uh, Test, test, oh yeah, test, beta testing. What I wanted to get at is the beta testing phase. Beta testing is a quite uh, interesting. I haven't seen that elsewhere before. Um, it allows you to test your application in the store environment. Okay. Um, so let's say you're a freelance developer or you're an ISV and you're, you're doing this application for a customer. A, let's say uh, an insurance or a bank and uh, they want to test it at one point. They want to, to test your application. Um, a classical w way would be to send them a CD or send them an email and they would have to install it. Maybe they don't know how to do this, so you would have to go visit them and install it on their tablet and get it to run somehow. Um, to make your life easier, we have this beta testing method what you do essentially is you type in email addresses of people who want to test your application. Uh, we send them an email saying uh, this is the Intel App App Store and such and such, Uwe or Cosimo or whoever would like you to test this application and click on this line and uh, download it and, and test it. And if you click on this URL in the store, Download would page would be shown where you can download the store. So if somebody hasn't already installed the, the store on his device, he could then download it. If he has already installed the store, um, I've used the Windows Store here because this is already out in, uh, in the public. The store has two areas. That's uh, too high up to jump to. Um, there's a store area here. This is the classical store where you can find applications. And uh, this is this My App area. My Apps, people find all the applications they've already installed on their device in My Apps. 
but they also find better test applications. So let's say this would be Uwe's, better, Uwe's new application that he wants us to test. So we could click on this and start the download and installation and test it, but we can also change the appearance and have a look at the metadata. We could have a look, is the icon good? Do we see it properly? Does it look good? We could check out the metadata. Do the screenshots look nice? Is the text correct? Is there any typos in the text? We could change the language of the store. Do we see this properly in different languages? So we can te test all these environments. We could do a download. We could do an installation. We could try the application. We could do the uninstallation. Uh, if it's already been installed, this download would change to an uninstall. So we can uninstall the application. If uh, Uwe gives us an update, it says here available updates. The application would appear in available updates. We could do an update of the application. We could do all these scenarios without Uwe having to come to our office and to do something on our tablet, any magic, to get this application on the tablet. We can do this completely remotely. That's a great thing. And this is all happening in the store environment. So the application is in the store backend. The com all the communication, authorization, all these things working. We can do crash reporting, we can do instrumentation, we can do all sorts of things in the store environment without this application past the validation yet. This is a pure beta testing environment, but it's the real store environment. Yes? You would have to submit them as two applications then. And then they become both visible in my applications. That's same. right. So the question was, can we have two um, different variants of an application? Let's say Uwe's done, done the application and it's 